I started out as an anti-GMO activist, and um, to my name I have field vandalisms of a number of different crops. Um, this was, of course, more than 15 years ago now. But then there was a, a process really where I became much more familiar and better educated about the science of biotechnology. And as a result of that deeper understanding, I was eventually forced to change my mind. And when you do change your mind on an issue, um, sometimes you, you eventually come out and you have to speak in public about it. Uh, especially, I felt I had to take responsibility for the anti-GMO activism that I'd previously been involved in, which has helped spread uh, misunderstanding and unfounded fears about the technology, not just around the UK and Europe, which was where I was working, but internationally as well. Uh, we've, we did a lot of damage to the prospects of science and technology and agriculture, and ultimately, uh, and very unfortunately, I think we did damage both to the sustainability prospects for agriculture and to the food security prospects of people in developing countries. And that's really what I'm working on now, is trying to figure out how the new technologies of crop breeding can be most useful to people in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world where um, food security is still an important preoccupation. I often get asked, was there a particular moment when a light bulb went on, when, when you had your road to Damascus conversion from being an anti-GMO activist to being somebody who would, well, I would characterize now as, as pro-science? Um, and the answer is, not really. There are one or two occasions I can think of when it began to sink in that I got this wrong. But it was a broader process, and it came about really through writing books on science of, of, of climate change, actually, and then finding out that the scientific consensus on this issue was very strong, going out into the public and being very involved in the controversial debate on, on global warming. And then a, a few years later, I found out that the scientific consensus on the safety of GMOs was just as strong, and yet the folks who were against that tended to be on the other side of the political divide. And that really made me think, because I was concerned not to be just an ideological partisan, you know, a sort of standard green lefty who would support science on climate change but deny it on, on, on the GMO issue. The GMO issue, of course, is an entirely global issue. You will, oddly enough, hear the same kinds of um, misinformation and uh, conspiracy theories about the dangers of GMOs, supposedly, in China or in Africa, as you, as you would in Europe or, or in the US, although, oddly enough, they can be quite culturally specific. Um, I've heard uh, audiences in Africa tell me that eating GMOs could uh, give your children homosexuality. In China, there's this uh, geopolitical concerns where a lot of people believe this rather bizarre theory that GMOs have been invented by the US to, to turn Chinese people sterile and stop them becoming the next superpower. So there's all sorts of uh, crazy stuff. Um, and, you know, and, and some of these fears are halfway legitimate about who controls the technology, but you don't uh, deal with issues of corporate concentration by trying to ban an entire field of science. Um, so it's really to try and tease out some of those illogicalities of the anti-GMO case that I'm happy really to, to speak to audiences, particularly those who have an agricultural, agricultural or trading or farming background. It's completely clear now that there is a worldwide scientific consensus that the process of uh, molecular level crop breeding, which is sort of summed up in this term GMO, which by the way has no scientific meaning, um, is as safe as any other form of crop breeding, um, including those used in the past such as selective breeding or even chemical and radiation mutagenesis. By the way, you can bombard a, a seed genome with radiation and then it could still be organic. So none of this is logical. Um, and there's been hundreds of independent studies now, um, going on to thousands actually, where the subject has been exhaustively looked at by scientific teams from all over the world. So in some ways, this is akin to the debate about vaccinations or about climate change. There isn't a debate within the scientific community, but there's a very big social debate because people have been fed uh, misinformation by vested interests. And it, it's very unfortunate that um, uh, public sector scientists right now are being attacked by vested interests, often very well funded, uh, and activists who are determined not to let scientists actually inform the general public 
about the truth of the safety of this technology. The big picture now for agriculture is sustainability. And this is the same in soy or any other you know, internationally traded commodity crop. Uh, world agriculture has to increasingly prove its sustainability. And that uh, comes into issues such as fertilizer runoff, um, um, the use of, uh, well, the production of, of greenhouse gas emissions, the high use of, of energy and fossil fuels in agriculture. Let's not forget that uh, mechanized intensive agriculture is what feeds the world. It produces very large amounts of, of very cheap commodity food, and that's what um, manages to keep the planet of well, over 7 billion people uh, increasingly well fed. But there are environmental concerns there, which um, particularly in rich countries, but more widely as well, are at the forefront of this conversation. And those are some of the things that actually motivate the anti-GMO and the organic and uh, a lot of these other somewhat niche concerns. And I think they're becoming mainstreamed. So the challenge for soy growers and, and for the industry as a whole is to ensure that it it, it both is sustainable and that it's seen to be becoming more sustainable so that, that message gets uh, taken out more widely and that people don't then reject the entirety of modern agriculture and you know insist on having to have everything produced at a very small scale very uh, by by local farmers markets and all that kind of stuff oftentimes that's actually worse environmentally that they're less efficient and they're less sustainable but we, we need to have the numbers we need to have the data and we need to make uh, properly informed evidence-based decisions the issue with food, of course, is that there's, it, it's not just another commodity. It's not just like steel or concrete. I mean, this is, this is something that you put into your body. And so it has a deeper resonance to people, both emotional and, of course, more widely, uh, a political resonance. And the issue of food prices, you know, if, you, if people are, going, are on the streets in developing countries because food prices have gone up, as has happened in the past, and they can't feed themselves, um, this is more than just another... Um, commodity spike. So I think it's, it's vitally important that those people who are involved in the trade and, and who work at this issue internationally appreciate just how significant this is and just how politically sensitive and, and contentious it is, uh, contentious it is and, and for good reasons. So they're involved in a business which, um, for which people may live or die. Um, and for that, for that reason, I think all of these issues have to be taken much more seriously than they might be in another kind of uh, uh, trade. We have to try and have a less ideological view of science and that's really what, um, what, what my work's focused on now. I work with the Cornell Alliance for Science based at Cornell University and, and we aim to try and disseminate a science-based perspective on, on all of these different issues and encourage people to think more scientifically and less ideologically.